the American people before November 3rd had no idea uh, of this information. And even, you know, we were, we were sounding the, the alarm bells since August and September and October uh, to DHS, to the White House, to anybody that we get to listen to. There are several congressmen who listen and who got it. Um, you know, Louis Gohmert down here in Texas, um, he got it right away. And, uh, he was willing to talk to the president about it, but, uh, you know, unfortunately not until after the election. So the problem with the Waldron, Gomer, Trump axis of, um, I don't know what to call it, disinformation, is that you know it's BS because Bill Barr, who acknowledged being willing to investigate voter fraud before the election, highly unusual, if not illegal, unethical, um, couldn't find any before, during, or after the election. We know that the only person who called on his voters to commit voter fraud was Donald Trump in North Carolina, told mm. them to vote twice. It's a felony there. We know that Chris Krebs, lifelong Republican, was fired for declaring that what Waldron alleged back in August, September, and October didn't happen. There was no interference. It was, quote, the most secure election in American history. So I guess it's not remarkable that Trump's attention was turned toward the liars and not the truth tellers in his own ranks. Yeah. But it does suggest that the plot, it started way before election day. It started way before the defeat. It started, they started laying the ground to do this, it would appear, in August. I, I would take you one better, Nicole. It started, uh, that ground became fertile in April, in May when President Trump indicated uh, that, you know, if I don't win this election this November, it's because of fraud. I mean, he was, this was, you go back and you listen to what the president was saying at his rallies, what he was saying in in, in his engagement with, with reporters around this issue of the election. Um, Trump had made it very clear. We know internal polling back at that time showed a great vulnerability for the president on the issue of COVID, um, that, as this process began to unfold, these narratives around the health and safety of the nation began to take its grip uh, on the families and communities across the nation where people were getting sick and dying, their attitudes were changing. That was reflected in the internal conversations and polling inside the White House. So you can begin, begin to track where the president's thinking evolved to lay down the predicate about this election. Uh, this was not a, a recognition of his failure as president to keep safe the American people, but rather a way to uh, address that uh, failure uh, and still win the day, win the argument. So it began long before we got into the fall, mm. um, where it became critical, critical mass for the president uh, to lay out a narrative that would rally his troops uh, to the polls and then ostensibly afterwards, but then also begin to utilize the mechanisms and controls of government um, on the way. And a test case of that were the summer riots and the president's response to that Lafayette, for example, of how he manipulated the Joint Chief into not only marching with him, but donning his uniform <laughs> to, to walk across Lafayette Park. So it showed the early manipulation of these agencies and the narrative by Trump long before we got into the throes of the aftermath of the 2020 election. Yeah, and he shows, well, he can't read the Constitution, he can read a poll. It's just amazing. Luke Broadwater, Carolyn Egg, thank you so much for your reporting on this um, still unfurling chapter. Michael